Hi, everybody. Happy Pride. My name is Bella Fitzpatrick. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm the CEO here at Shout It. I'm going to go through some LGBTQ plus terminology, some bits and bobs about the community, so we can all have a much more uh, fluid conversation during Pride. Um, hopefully, you'll find this informative, um, and I'd really love to hear back from you if you have any questions, queries, or any um, corrections for me. I'm very open to be being corrected. Um, so let me just share my screen so we can all look at some slides. So I've just, you know, put together this uh, information session to go through some of the different terminology and some of the different um, pieces about L the LGBT community that we might want to bear in mind uh, for Pride. Um, we're coming from a point of view of doing a lot of workshops in schools and reaching a lot of young people, um, which we're really proud of. So just to give you a little bit of background about Shout Out, we're a really small organization. We have three members of staff, um, but we have hundreds of incredible volunteers and the volunteers are the people who do those workshops in schools and that's our main activity as well as that we provide uh, educational resources for those who work with young people or those who provide a service so that those services can be more lgbtq plus inclusive we also do workshops in workplaces and um, so work can be a place where lgbtq plus people are accepted and like a lot of people right now we're working from home the reason we started doing workshops in schools is because, well, we had all kind of had a rubbish time in school. A lot of us had gotten bullied, a few of us had to move school due to that, and we just thought, wow, what a difference it would have made if our classmates had gotten a, a talk on LGBT issues, if they knew a little bit more about LGBT issues, so it didn't um, seem so alien to them. So we started doing that. We started that in 2012, just going into local schools, having chats, and and all these years later, this is still our main activity. Uh, this year we did 252 school workshops. Um, I'm hugely grateful to the volunteers that made that happen. Obviously this year was a little different. All of our school workshops took place virtually online, but maybe we'll get back into the classroom a little bit later in the year, we'll see. Our main uh, concern is keeping absolutely everyone safe, including our volunteers, teachers, and students. In the shout out workshop in schools, we go through a lot of different terminology, some of which I'll go through today, and we talk about how to be a good ally. But there's a few things to bear in mind first. The first thing is that no definition can fully encompass the lived experience of the LGBTQ plus people. So I'll be giving a lot of definitions today, but they might not exactly fit how you feel about that, that label that you use for yourself. And another thing is with labels is that people tend to think about labels as a negative thing, but labels are very useful. They're very useful for us to find each other. For example, I'm bi, and I find it really useful to find other bi people because I have that word, and that word helps me find my community. So while we don't want to be defined by our labels, they are something that really do help. And it's important to note that it's not that people see a label and then think, oh, I'll be like that. It's that people have a lived experience and then they find out that there's a word to describe that. So I realized that I could fancy someone and it didn't really matter what gender that person was. I could just fancy them based on, you know, many other factors, but their gender really wasn't one of them. And then someone told me, well, there's a word for that. And therefore I identify as bisexual. Um, this is something that is really, really useful for people to realize, you know, I'm not alone. There's actually other people who have this experience and we are all kind of connected through this, this world, word. Um, but as I say, no definition can fully encompass a lived experience. And if you're having a different experience to the definition I give, then that's totally fine. That's totally cool. These should be informative, not prescriptive. Um, another thing to bear in mind is that um, definitions can't be 100% right, but they can be very, very wrong. So our definitions are only ever the most up-to-date terminology we have right now, and we're always striving towards being more inclusive um, and having a kind of better understanding of these issues for everyone. Um, but that's not to say that 
these definitions won't change over time, that we won't have a different understanding uh, in the future. So they're never 100% right, but you can have a definition that's very wrong. And it can be wrong if your definition is excluding a lot of people. So that's why I'm going to use very broad definitions um, today um, that are mo the most inclusive. And they might not be as specific as the definition you use for yourself or a friend uses for themselves, but it'll be the most up-to-date one we have at the moment. And if I'm not using the most up-to-date one, please let me know, uh, comment, um, tweet, do whatever, um, you know, because these things are constantly updating. And, you know, having not being able to be in person in schools, we're not getting that most up-to-date information from the young people. Even though we still had a great presence in school this year, it was online, so it was a little bit different. So it's always great to be um, updated if anybody has an update for me. And then our kind of final thing to bear in mind is you are in charge of your own label. You do not have to define yourself to anybody. You do not have to prove it. You do not have to explain it. You can simply state it. You get to choose your label and it doesn't matter how other people feel about it. Um, what we would like is that everyone was accepting of everyone's labels and how they identify for themselves and their experiences. And that's not always the case, but you know yourself better than anybody else. So, you know, if you're someone who's trans, then you're absolutely trans. You do not have to do X, Y, and Z to prove that. If you're someone who's pansexual, you do not have to debate why you're not using the term bisexual. If you're someone who's straight, but everyone thinks that you're not, you do not have to prove that to anyone. I believe you and you know, you're in charge of those labels and you should use whatever label makes you feel most comfortable. But also being aware that these things can change over time and you won't always necessarily identify the same way because all of these identities are fluid. So I'm gonna look at the acronym uh, a little bit quickly. So the acronym we use is LGBTQIA+, um, which you don't need to be able to say as quickly as I'm saying it, but you um, can if you get a lot of practice. So it's something that comes with a lot of practice. Um, you don't have to use this acronym. You can use any acronym that feels uh, best for you, LGBT, LGBTQ, LGBTI, LGBTQIA, whichever feels best for you. This is the one we use because we do a lot of work in schools. And if we didn't use this one, um, someone would give out to us <laughs> because young people are really aware of all these, these different identities and they want to see ones that are very inclusive. Uh, different organizations use different acronyms and that's totally cool. Um, the government uses LGBTI+, um, different organizations use LGBTQ+. We would often use LGBTQ+, when um, we're writing documents, but for talking about the entire acronym, we'll use LGBTQIA+. So let's quickly go through them. L, I'm sure you know, stands for lesbian, um, the definition of which is means usually a woman who's attracted to other women. But I'm going to say usually there because there's a lot of fluidity under the concept of woman. And because a lesbian is a very old term, it's been around for ages. For a long time, there wasn't a lot of nuance in regards to how we thought about other gender identities. And actually, lesbian was used as an overarching term for anybody who wasn't a man who was attracted to people who weren't men. Uh, so we can maybe say non-men attracted to non-men might be another way of describing this, or women attracted to women, or kind of whatever way best suits you. Now, when we say non-men, what we're saying is we're saying women, um, non-binary people who want to be included under a non-men umbrella and other ident gender identities that are included under a non-men umbrella. Whether you want to be included under non-men is totally up to you. When we say non-men, we're not centering men um, because there's non in front of it, just like the being non-binary does not center the binary. So that's lesbian. We have here Catherine Sapone. Um, she's someone who has been kind of very public um, you know, as a politician, someone who fought very hard for marriage equality, and she's a lesbian. So she's uh, someone we know in the Irish sphere. Uh, she was a TD um, and a minister uh, for children and youth affairs, and she fought really hard uh, to get marriage equality, um, along with a lot of amazing activists. So that's lesbian. 
Next we have gay. Um, gay can be used for people of any gender and it just means that you're attracted to genders that are similar to your own. Um, it's often used for men who are attracted to other men, uh, but it can kind of be used in a more nuanced or fluid way. We have here Garrett Thomas. Uh, he's a Welsh rugby player. He came out about 10 years ago now in a field where there's not really a lot of out people in rugby. Um, so it's really great to see Garrett Thomas come out. He also came out as HIV positive and he's done a lot of work to kind of um, fight the stigma uh, around being HIV positive um, because he's someone who's obviously very fit, very healthy. He ran an Ironman and he's here to say, you know, if you're on effective medication, it does not impact your life expectancy or your health at all. Also, if you're in, on effective medication, you cannot transmit it. If you have an undetectable viral load, then you are untransmittable, um, which is sometimes known under the banner of U equals U. Undetectable means untransmittable. So that's gay. Next, we have uh, B for bisexual. That's me. Um, bisexual is an old term. It's been around since about the 1850s. And since then, its definition has really kind of changed over the years. And for the past several decades, the definition that bi the bi community has used is an attraction to more than one gender or an attraction to genders that are similar to your own and attraction to genders that are different to your own. It's not an attraction to men and women. We don't look at it in a binary sense. It's really a lot more fluid than that. Of course, a lot of people mistake it for meaning an attraction to just men and women. We have here Angelina Jolie, someone who's been out as bi for ages and someone who's often not thought of as part of the LGBT community. And this can happen a lot to bi people in the public eye. Uh, you know, people who are bisexual are just kind of thought of as either gay or straight based on, you know, maybe who their partner is. And that can be really frustrating because what that means is that there's kind of less visibility for bi people, even though there's lots and lots of bi people. There's more bisexual people than there are lesbian gay people put together, but there's still less visibility. And we have to remember that, you know, there's still a lot of stigma for bisexual people. Um, the mental health of bi young people is worse than their lesbian and gay counterparts. So don't let bi jokes slide, um, you know, call people out when they say them because it really is contributing to the stigma. The T stands for trans or transgender. There might be other words you've heard as well, um, but the overarching word we use is trans or transgender. And, you know, the definition of that, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail, but it's for people who have a gender identity, which is different to the sex assigned to them at birth. Um, and there's lots of amazing trans people we have here. Ju just uh, three examples. Uh, Laverne Cox, who's an amazing trans woman. She's an actor. She was on Orange is the New Black. She's in A Fantastic Young Woman. Um, and a promising young woman, sorry, uh, which is a new movie. And, you know, she's she's really, really incredible. She's on the cover of Time magazine as well, which is great. Then we have Chaz Bono. He's a trans man. He's probably best known for being Cher's son. But he's also, you know, he's an actor. Um, he was in American Horror Story and other bits and bobs. So, you know, um, has his own uh, career as well as being Cher's son. Then we have Sam Smith, they're a singer. They came out a, a few years ago as non-binary and they use they, them pronouns, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, they're really, really famous and really, really popular amongst young people, which is great to see. They have like a lovely singing voice. Um, they sing kind of like, ballads and they won an Oscar actually for a James Bond song, I believe. The Q stands for queer, and that's something I'm going to talk a little bit more about, but it's a very nuanced term. Um, and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. The I stands for intersex, and the definition we have for intersex is People who have sexual characteristics not typically associated with being exclusively either male or female. It's got to do with your body in terms of um, physical attributes, but also chemical attributes you might have in terms of hormones. It's just got to do with the fact that, you know, there's a lot of diversity between individuals and there's a lot of diversity in terms of uh, different characteristics of sex that people have. And um, we have here Castor Semenya. She's an incredible athlete. She's an amazing person. Uh, she runs um, short distances in the Olympics and um, 
if you know anything about her story, you'll know a lot about intersex issues. I uh, highly recommend following her on any social media because she's really, really incredible. Then uh, the A stands for asexual. Um, and this is for people who experience um, very little or no sexual attraction to other people. So, um, you know, not not having that experience of sexual attraction. That doesn't mean that asexual people don't all um, not want to be in a relationship. Some do, some don't. If they don't, then they might consider themselves aromantic as well as asexual. Um, but it's really, you know, it's a sexual orientation, just like being lesbian or gay or bi or pan or straight. It's a sexual orientation. It's not something that can be changed uh, for anybody. Um, and a lot of asexual people are not very well represented, particularly John Pride. And there can be debates on, on whether, you know, asexual people should be even at Pride, which is terrible to see because we shouldn't gatekeep. And um, Asexual people are are our siblings. They're part of the community. They always have been. They always will be, and it is being part of a minority group to be asexual, especially since the world is so kind of orientated around sexuality and fancying people. And of course, you're otherized if you're asexual. And of course, they're part of the LGBTQ plus community. Absolutely, we should all remember to um, be good allies to our asexual siblings. Um, we have here Francis Brennan. He's someone who came out uh, as asexual a few years ago. He has um, a show on RTE about like hotels and stuff. He's really cool and it's really nice to see uh, some Irish famous representation for asexual people. The P then stands for pansexual, meaning attraction to people regardless of gender. Um, we have here Janelle Monet. Uh, she is a actor and singer. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, that sounds very similar to the definition you gave to bisexual. And in some sense, you know, they can be considered similar. Uh, what essentially it means is that, um, you know, they're linguistically different. Uh, bi has the root that means two and pan has the root that means all like panorama. Um, and the linguistic update uh, really came around about the 70s and 80s, but it's only been kind of popularized in the past 10 years, I'd say. And um, basically it's kind of an updated term for the fact that bisexual is misinterpreted as an attraction to just men and women a lot. So it kind of came out of that, but also, some bisexual people are like, well, you know, I'm attracted to men and non-binary people, um, but not every single gender uh, that I meet where pansexual people will be attracted to individual people completely regardless of, of their gender identity. So there is a difference there, but for a lot of people, they do overlap and a lot of people do use both uh, labels interchangeably. Um, you know, there there is, um, you know, a good community there for bi and pan people and kind of anybody under the bi umbrella, which includes a lot of other small micro identities like omnisexual, polysexual and other uh, identities like this. But pansexual is very popular um, amongst young people, maybe because the um, role models in their life use pansexual like Janelle Monet, but also Lady Gaga and Miley Cyrus. So it's absolutely fantastic that there's a label that so many people feel confident using and enjoy using for themselves so it's it's really it is really 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 great whether you use bi or pan for yourself is it's a personal choice you know I came out in 1999 I hadn't heard the ta term pansexual and now I'm just quite attached to the term bisexual it suits me a little bit better uh, for whatever reason and that reason you know doesn't have to be anything big I, I like the letter b my name starts with the letter b I enjoy bees um you know that can be your reason it doesn't have to be anything more than that so it's just whatever kind of suits you and then the plus is kind of like etc because we kind of want to recognize that we couldn't possibly you know encompass everyone here and also this is culturally specific and if you were in a different country you might see a different acronym for example if you were in north america in um, what is now the usa or canada they'll probably have 2s here as well and 2s is a specific identity for indigenous native american people um, so that's not something we necessarily include in europe but by the plus we kind of recognize that is there we recognize we can't 
possibly encompass everyone, but the plus is always really important to have. Um, so we do love to see the plus whenever possible. So those are some really quick definitions. I totally understand if you're thinking that's not the full story here with regards to any of these, totally get that. But for a broad understanding of these ideas and also the people behind them, that's the thing that these aren't just letters, these are people, these are individual people living their lives, trying to do so by, you know, just doing whatever they want to do, having friends, having going to work, going to school, living their life, and they just want to do so without harassment, without stigma, uh, without people constantly questioning them. And that's why we wanted to say, look, there are people behind these letters. These are not just labels for labels sake. I want to talk a little bit about the binary, because I think the what we want to remember is that the binary um, hopefully is over we want to be done with it um because the binary is the idea that there are only two options for something and the binary comes into a lot of different um parts of the lgbtq plus um community so um the binary would suggest that for gender that there's only men and women and for sexual orientation that there's only gay and straight and for biological sex there's only males and females that's the binary idea of it it's very black and white it's not very nuanced um there's not not, not a room for fluidity there but we want to say like you know that the binary isn't right because for um gender we have men and women but we also have non-binary people non-binary being an umbrella term for anybody who identifies outside the male female gender binary, sexual orientation. Yeah, there are gay and straight people, but there's also bisexual and pansexual people too, of course. And for biological sex, there's males and females, um, but there's also intersex people as well. And, you know, the delineation between gender and biological sex is confusing and uh, blurry and um, something that's quite complex because gender is quite a complex topic, but so is biological sex. Biological sex is quite a complex topic as well. But the binary is, you know, a really limited way of thinking about things. And we should always remember that there are other people, there are other experiences as well. And so I just wanted to leave you with this quote, which is, Life is not so black and white. Much beauty exists in infinite shades of gray. And that is a quote by Kimberly M. Zieleman, who is an intersex activist. Uh, she's an incredible woman. She wrote this book, which I just happen to have on my desk in front of me. Um, she found out that she was intersex at the age of um, about 41. And this memoir is about her finding that out and going from uh, what she describes herself as a soccer mom to being a, an activist. And, you know, I think she's really hit the nail in the head here which is that life is not black and white and there's so much beauty in all the infinite shades of gray and we just have to remember to look out for them and not try to think about things in such black and white terms just to go back to queer and i said i'd, I'd touch on it again you know queer is um it's a really nuanced term. It's a term that's been around for a long time. Um, and it's been around to mean different or strange or weird uh, and has been used against LGBTQ plus people, uh, used as a negative word, a word to um, really put us down and to otherize us. But at the same time, it's also been reclaimed. Uh, in some of the early pride marches, people would chant, we're here, we're queer we'd like to say hello. That was one of the first chants. Um, and then it became, we're here, we're queer, get used to it. Um, we, got, we lost a little bit of patience there. So queer means many different things, but it comes from this idea of being different. And I guess when we reclaimed it, what we wanted to say is, yeah, okay, maybe we're different. Maybe we lead, lead different lives. Maybe we experience things differently, but that difference isn't bad and it isn't unequal and it isn't wrong. Um, so queer has come to be many different things. You can identify as queer, and I identify as queer as well, so I identify as bi and queer, and I see queerness to be um, something that connects me to all LGBTQ plus people. So um, while I might be bisexual and my friend might be trans and a lesbian, we're both queer and that's kind of what's connecting us. Um, so you can identify as queer and you can identify as just as queer. You don't have to identify as queer and a different letter as well. You can identify just as queer and you can identify as queer in terms of your gender identity or in terms of your sexual orientation. 
But queer is also um, a cultural term in terms of like art um, that we might consume. So we might talk about um, films that are made by LGBTQ plus people and we might call that queer cinema or queer theater or queer literature. But people do still use queer as an insult and it's important to be mindful when you are using it, you know, um, is that going to upset someone who's heard it in a really negative way. Um, so just be mindful when you're using it. Um, never, you know, yell it across the street. You can use it, um, of course, but, you know, just be aware that not everyone um, loves it because they might have had some really negative times with the word. I, I personally, you know, it's my favorite word. Um, it's something that I really, really, really enjoy and something I really embrace, but I'm also aware that like other people don't have that experience and that's also valid. I want to talk a little bit more about gender now for a bit. Um, one thing we hear a lot is that gender is a spectrum and that there's not these two options, one male, one female, but actually there is a spectrum and people can identify anywhere along that spectrum. That's a really good way to think about it. I want to expand it a little bit further and think of it as um, less of a spectrum and more of a triangle. Now, this is just a, a learning tool. It's not, I'm not saying that this is exactly what gender identity is. Gender identity is, is so much more complex than a triangle. But it's one way to think about it, you know, that there are people who identify as male and people who identify as female and people who identify completely outside that binary entirely. And the umbrella term for that is non-binary. And really your gender identity can exist anywhere within um, this triangle here. It doesn't have to be one corner or another. It can be fluid and move throughout. It really just depends on you as an individual person, but also in the culture you're experiencing. Um, for me, for example, I identify as female, so I'm right down here in the corner. Um, there's not a lot of fluidity for me in that. I just kind of identify as female and it's not something I give a huge amount of thought to. I really enjoy being female. And if you feel a huge kinship towards all women um, that I meet, um, you know, I just feel really connected to, to women, um, whether those women are Irish or cis or trans or, or anything else. I just, I really just like women. <laughs> um, so, you know, that would be my gender identity. Now, my gender identity happens to um, correspond with the sex that I was assigned at birth. So I identify as female, but also my birth certificate says female. And that has made life pretty easy for me in terms of um, moving through the world with my gender identity. Um, because my birth certificate says female, so does my passport and so do other documents. So I've never had any trouble when I've gone to, say, an airport and handed someone my passport. I've never had to be worried about how they feel about that because I feel like I was assigned correctly at birth. I feel like when I was given that um, assignation at birth that it, it was done correctly because I feel like that's also how I identify. And not everyone has that journey. Some people get assigned at birth um male or female which is kind of the only two options in Ireland not the only two options around the world but here and they grow up and they might feel differently to that and they might feel differently from a very young age or that might be something that they feel later on in life there's no one way to do it but you know the fact that then their birth certificate says this can actually be really problematic for that person because they might not identify that way and they might not live that way and actually having all of their documents in the that sex is really really problematic for them and really difficult and so it's really important that we have legislation that allows people to change their legal status in terms of whether they are legally considered male or female unfortunately we don't have any um, legal bearing for someone to change their gender identity from either male or female to a non-binary or non-specific gender marker. We don't have that in Ireland. It's coming in in different countries. Um, so it's something that maybe we can look forward to having in the future. Um, and now just to talk a little bit more about intersex people. So intersex people are those with bodies that do not fit the typical medical definition of either male or female. And how is that? Well, biological sex, very complicated, made up of a combination of chromosomes, hormones, internal reproductive organs, external reproductive organs, and secondary sexual characteristics. Secondary sexual characteristics are things that happen at puberty, like the deepening of the voice, facial hair growth, breast development, that type of thing. 
And these can actually come in many different combinations. They tend to follow a specific pattern. They don't have to, um, they don't always. And really you can have many different combinations of these characteristics. And <clears throat> we have very strict ideas of what male and female is. So sometimes people have bodies that fall, fall outside those definitions. And the umbrella term for that is intersex. Um, People tend to think about biological sex in really strict binary ways. So they'll say things like, well, XX chromosomes are for women and XY chromosomes are for men. But that's not true. Um, there's lots of women with XY chromosomes. There's lots of men with XX chromosomes. Um, but also those aren't the only chromosome combinations. Uh, you can have XXY or just X on its own. Um, there's lots of different ways to kind of have a body and all of those ways are completely cool and valid. And there's nothing wrong with being intersex. The only thing that's wrong is that we have built the world around there only being males and females, and that really otherizes intersex people. Um, and you might be surprised to hear that intersex people are 1.7% of the population. So it's not, it's not that rare, it's not that unusual. Uh, there's lots and lots of intersex people around, and um, it's just something that we need to create um, more awareness of, because for intersex people, um, lots of people have never even heard the term, don't even know about it, and um, that can mean that it can be really difficult to come out if you want to. Now, not all intersex people want to, and that's totally, you know, valid, um, but if they do, they should be able to. And so there's a fantastic organization in Ireland called Intersex Ireland that are working for, um, you know, the liberation of intersex people, so I'd recommend following them. Uh, and for anything trans-related, I recommend following TENI, the Transgender Equality Network of Ireland, both amazing organizations. Now just to talk a little bit about pronouns. I said at the top of the session that my pronouns are she and her. Um, now most of you might know what I mean by that, but if you don't, what that means is that's how you can talk about me. So if you want to talk about me and you say Bella, she works in shout out, her um, her dog is nice, <laughs> you know, you would say she and her, that's how you refer to me. Those are my pronouns, that's how you refer to me. I don't like it when people use any other pronouns for me. I don't like it, it makes me feel uncomfortable. So if you were to say Bella, he lives uh, in loud, I wouldn't like that. Um, even if you say Bella, they work and shed it, I don't like that either. She and her work best for me, that's how I like to be referred to as. And everyone should have their pronouns respected, no matter what they are. And the thing is, is that you can't tell by looking at someone what their pronouns are. So um, sometimes we say our pronouns or we display them in our email signature or somewhere else. And that's just part of kind of being inclusive and letting people know how to refer to you. It's just it's super, super easy. And some people use she, her pronouns, some people use he, him pronouns, and some people use they, them pronouns. Um, so like Sam Smith, I've already described, they're a singer, they came out a couple of years ago, that type of thing. I'm going to give a little example now. So Max is non-binary, their dad is finding it hard to understand. So here's a little play I've had together, I'll play both characters. Um, so the dad says, my boy, my son, my sonny boy, and Max says, Hey dad, remember I'm non-binary, so I preferred less gender terms because dad here has used a bunch of gender terms like son and my boy. And then dad said, oh, it's too hard and I don't understand. And Max said, okay, but could you just try to respect it and maybe you'll understand better with time. The dad said, okay, my child, my offspring, my kin. And Max says, thanks dad, because my child, my offspring and my kin are gender neutral terms. Um, so that's something that Max feels a little bit more comfortable with. And what we're saying here is, dad here doesn't necessarily need to completely understand Max's perspective in order to respect it. You don't necessarily need to understand something to be an ally, to be good at respecting someone's uh, pronouns and their opinion. And of course we might make mistakes and we all do, but it's really important we make an effort and that we try and mistakes happen. Um, but if we are ever purposefully using the wrong name or pronouns for a person that is, that is, you know, really, really, really mean and, and it's, you know, verging on harassment to do that on purpose. So everyone has the right to be respected. Um, and it's really important that we, we make an effort. And if we do make a mistake, that we apologize and we move on. 
So that's kind of part of being an ally. And on that, we want to say like, we can all be allies. It's not just um, people outside the community that need to be allies. We all need to be allies. So I'm a bi woman, but I'm an intersex ally. I'm a trans ally. I'm a lesbian ally. I'm a pan ally. I'm a queer ally. I'm a gay ally, you know? And you too need to be an ally to other letters that you're not, but also of other identities that intersect with LGBTQ plus people. So, you know, people can have many different identities. They can be, um, LGBTQ plus and neurodivergent, they can be LGBTQ plus and an asylum seeker, they can be LGBTQ plus and disabled. And we need to be aware of people having um, intersecting marginalization. And if they do, how can we be an ally to them? Ally is a verb, it's something that you do, it's uh, something you act upon. So a few different tips for that would be, you know, use your power. If you have any power in a situation, use that. If that's something like, um, you know, you are very popular in school and you can call out a joke easily, do that. Or if you're someone who has um, a lot of power in work, um, you know, use that. If you're someone who's white, stand, stand up for people who are not white. If you're someone who's able-bodied, stand up for people who are disabled. Um, you know, whatever power you have, use it. Um, call out discrimination whenever you hear it and then help out backstage. And what we mean by backstage is, you know, if your friends uh, who are trans are putting on an event, for example, what can you do to go and, you know, buy cups or um, send out the emails? Something that's backstage that's helping them, but isn't putting yourself front and center. And, and you can do that really easily by, you know, if your friend is, is an activist, is someone who's fighting for LGBTQ plus people, um, make them dinner. Uh, you know, just do something like that. Make them a cup of tea, even. That's still helpful and that's still allyship. And, you know, we all need to be looked after. Um, and if your way of looking after people is to do something like that, then that's that's great. And that's part of activism as well. So anything you can do backstage is really helpful. And then finally, our pride picks. These are some uh, movies and TV and books that we recommend. My top pick here will be A Fantastic Woman, which is a Chilean film, uh, which is excellent. And my top pick, pick for the book, who you can already imagine, is XOXY by Kimberly Zielemann, which I think is excellent. But all of these books and movies and TV shows are really, really good. Um, and now, if you do have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to us on shoutout.ie. My email address is here, and here's our Twitter and Facebook. And we would wish you all a very happy and safe Pride season. And you know, get in touch if we can ever be of any help. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Happy Pride.